What Do We Do? A podcast discussing wealth management and financial planning. Introducing listeners to the leaders in our community. Hosted by the founder and CEO of Great Lakes Wealth, Dewey Steffen. Alongside WWJ Midday News anchor, Brooke Allen. Hey, I'm Brooke Allen. Our goal with the What Do We Do podcast is to educate listeners on topics that impact your financial growth, your retirement, and your lifestyle. And I'm Dewey Steffen. Join us twice a month as we welcome some of today's leaders in the community for conversations that can help with investment decisions so you can plan for and live your best life. Here's Dewey Steffen alongside Brooke Allen. Well, hello everyone out there in YouTube land, podcast nation. This is Dewey Steffen, co-host of the What Do We Do podcast. I am so excited to be back for another episode today. This is season two, episode three, and number 45. Today we have a special guest joining us for today's podcast. This podcast is about community. And in our community, we want to find leaders that have a story to tell, knowledge to share, and advice to give. And today's guest, I believe, will be able to help us with all of those. Ladies and gentlemen, my friend, and today's guest, Mr. Mike Valenti. Mike, it's good to see you. How are you? Good to see you, man. What's going on? Well, I'm uh, happy to have you here. And why don't we start, just in case there are some viewers and some listeners that don't know you, can you give us an abbreviated, let's make it quick, we have a lot to get into today, but an abbreviated history of your life. Okay, so yeah, Mike Valeni. I do afternoon drive. Uh, God, seventeen years now in Detroit. Uh, originally from New York, and look, I, I ask me whatever you want to ask. What do when you want that? What do you want a whole biography? All right, so listen, let's go to what Tell brought you what to you Detroit. Want. Well, okay, for those good. that don't know, yeah. you were born and raised in upstate New York. Yeah, right. Yeah, and little town somehow. Detroit. I mean, and I probably to meet me, probably to see me, probably because you knew one day down the road you'd see this guy Dewey. But besides that, what brought you to Metro Detroit? Yeah, no, it's 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 funny, and I've I've told the story a couple of times. So, no one in my family went to college, so I was the first to go. So it wasn't this idea of okay, I'm gonna go to Michigan. It was, I know I'm getting out of here. So like where I grew up, Capital Region, there's not really much there. Like it's it's an okay place, but. I knew there was more out there for me. So, like, I always loved sports, and I loved radio. Loved it. Um, like, WFAN is a station in New York City, much like 97 won the ticket here in Detroit, where huge signal, you can hear it far away. So, summers, you know, I would not be in school. I'd drive around with my dad, and you'd hear that voice coming out of the the speaker, and we'd listen to sports radio, and it was this thing. It was kind of I know now it's different because there's so many platforms, even like what we're doing right now, unthinkable 20 years ago. But I fell in love with the medium of this idea that I could pick up the phone and I can call this guy on the radio and argue about sports. So that was that's always been what I wanted to do. I never wanted to be a a writer. I never wanted to be a TV host. I never wanted to do any of that. So um, once I got of age, you know, 13, 14 years old, I'm like, all right, this is what I want to do. Where do I do it? And look, I didn't have guidance, you know, I mean, dude, like I said, it's, I didn't have people to lean on who had done it before me. So I literally, I went to the bookstore back when there was bookstores I picked up the Princeton review guide and it was, all right, what are the best journalism schools? You know, I didn't even know what you were supposed to study to do radio. And, you know, there was a collection of schools and Syracuse, BU, um, Michigan state was one. And, and look, it was, my parents were great about it in that they couldn't pay for school, but they were like, look, we're not going to stop you. You can go wherever you want to go. You're paying for it. Is that called broadcast journalism? That would be the major? I mean, sure. I, what I do is not journalism. Right, That's right. the misnomer. Right. What I do is entertainment. Right. Um, or now I know there's this new chic term of infotainment, but like, Ooh, nice. I just knew I wanted to get out. And it was one of those things of Michigan State, there was a little bit of a pull. And I know it's kind of silly now sitting here as a 40 year old, but when you're a kid, you know, you. You look on TV, you see the teams that are playing, and that was back when MSU used to use that Gruff Sparty logo. You remember? Uh-huh. And now Gruff sure. is back For a little sure bit. sure that we both got the beard. Right, but it was um, it was one of those things that there was a pull to it. And then when I got to see it, uh, on the East Coast, there just aren't a lot of schools that have that sprawling Big Ten campus, you know, a football stadium next to your math class. It was just once I saw it, I go, that's it. This is where I want to be. So I did it, um, and that – 
that was really the whole impetus, impetus to bringing me out here was, I know I want to do radio. This is a great journalism school. And I've always kind of felt a connection to this place. And then once I visited it, it was game over. A lot of the other schools I visited, I was just like, yeah, no, I'm not going there. And we know you graduated from there. That was 2002? Yeah. Okay. Um, did you God, go home in the old. summers? Did you like stay here year round? Did you start in first first two summers? I went home uh, and I worked in radio. Giants, the New York Giants, did their training camp in Albany, so at U Albany, which is the State University of New York. Um, and I would work training camp. I mean, running wires, setting up you know a portable little broadcast show. Like I would work a day job and pack the radio equipment in the morning. I'd leave for my day job, you know, and I I did all kinds of you know jobs we all did in college. And then I'd get get out at five, and I'd immediately dart over to training camp. Had to have a show set up by six thirty, do the show, you know, get the sound, run and get a player for interviews, whatever, and then pack up at nine p.m. and then get up the next morning at six a.m. and do it all over again. And then finally, but yeah, by junior year, you're staying out here. And then you're, you know, now I got radio internships. And look, it all started really with that one small internship because that gave me a chance to say, listen, at least on the technical side, I can do these things for you. And then the gentleman I was working for actually gave me a spot. And he said, look, you do a good job all summer. I'll put you on the last day you're here and we can do a college football segment. Okay. Sounds like a square deal to me. So I remember, and it, it, it sounds crazy now, but I remember my parents recording on a tape deck, me being on radio that night and doing that 10 minutes. But that 10 minutes became my first demo tape. And I took that tape back to school. And then that tape is what I handed to somebody at a station in Lansing. And they go, okay, this is, that sounds pretty good. So then you have this, you start stacking things. And now you're staying out here, you're doing your internships, you're building that resume and you just, yeah, you do a lot of the odd jobs to make money, but the radio thing was all I ever wanted to do. I didn't want to do anything else. I didn't want to be a writer or any of that. How did you make uh, that jump from passing it around uh, to stations in East Lansing to land yeah. on 97 when the ticket? So when I, I started out there, there was an AM station in Lansing and um, the radio show there was a producer and you're basically a gopher. You just do whatever you're told and away you go. And then there was an FM station that was starting up and a couple of guys who I was working for got a show over there. And my job was to produce their show. And then there was a show after me and the show after without being you know, rude, uh, struggled. So it got to a point where, look, I was, I was working my way onto their show. I would prep them. I'd have all their stuff ready. So this is my senior year of college now. Um, I mean, God, I was up at 430 in the morning, you know, you're to the station by 530 for a 6 a.m. show, 6 to 10, and then 10 to noon was the second show. And then I would finish my classes in the afternoon, and then I would bus tables at night. So, yeah, I mean, my senior year was nuts. But I basically talked my way into that first job um, because after a while of being on the air, 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. and helping those two guys, um, it was – look, I can do this. Give me a chance. You know, th this show you're putting on struggles, like it's not good. It's not a secret. Like give me a chance. And if you don't like it, um, just you can launch me out of a cannon basically. I go, but like, give me a chance at this. And I was persistent about it. Like I don't, there's no, <laughs> you know me, it's just that that's how I am. And then once I started that, then it was just steamroller. Like I would do the 6 a.m. to 10 a.m., immediately go to the other side of the table and now I'm hosting 10 to noon and that was I would save the tapes every day I would take those tapes and I would take the best segments I would catalog them label them and that's how you started building the demo and then it eventually got to a point just to complete the circle you want to know how did I get to Detroit mm -hmm. I sent one tape down to there were two AM stations at that time one of them was hiring one of them was probably not going to be hiring for several months and what happened was when I applied at the time, it was for 1270. Um, the PD at the time was Kevin Graham and Kevin actually thought I was older. Like Kevin by my tapes. And again, this is 2004. It's, it's not like now, you know, everyone's carrying a supercomputer around every day. Like he thought I was older. He didn't realize I was only God, you know, 23 year old kid. That's where I was going to interrupt and ask Mike that yeah. this was all your sub 25. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you start as behind the microphone, 
yeah. um, in the back room, in the control room, if you want to call what I mean, you don't, right? I mean, there's guys who are 30, 35 females that yeah. are older that want well, that you, spot. You right? answer phones, yeah. you produce shows, you go and get coffee, you go and get lunch, you do sales calls, you set up remote broadcasts, you do it all. I've done every job in, in, in the game. So pay your dues. Yeah, which is something I think a lot of people have lost sight of, but that's probably a different discussion. But it's it's more, it just kind of came down to this thing where he's like, look, I, you're way younger than I thought you were, but your tape doesn't sound like it, so maybe we can take a chance on this. And that's, that's kind of how it all began. Honestly, just getting to Detroit and getting the opportunity. And then once we did, it was just, I don't know, it just kind of took off and you know, I got down there and I was paired up my original partner, Terry Foster, and we just started and it was, that different. was the sports inferno. Yeah. That was back in the day. Um, and it was just different. You know, I, it's so, you know, what's weird is like, you get to a point now, you know, at 40 where you don't really care what anybody thinks anymore. You're just past that point in your life. But when I look back at it, I never feared failing. Like I never feared like, Oh, this won't be good. It's like, no, you've worked your whole life to get in this spot, cut it loose. And I mean, I got, in, I got in trouble and, you know, said things that got me in trouble, but I never curbed it on the air. But it was so weird as like, I never worried about failing and will this not work? It was more, will people like this, right? Like, you waste so much time and energy thinking about like, oh, gee, I wonder if someone, it, it, will people like the segment I just did? Even though in your heart, you know, like, this is good. I know what I'm doing is good. I know it's quality. Let's go. But I never allowed it to impact what I did on the air. And you just go and like you just full throttle. And I think that was different. I think when I was 24, I mean, when you look back at Detroit, 04, 05, you know, Tigers didn't get really good until 06. And it was just, I had a different perspective. I was younger than any of the other guys. I wasn't from here. I did I was very open. I still am. Like, I'm not a fan of your teams. You, you don't pay me to be a fan of your teams. You're paying me to, at, at least you listen because you you like my perspective and it's honest. And I, I rip my own teams the way I rip yours. Now the connection point. Yeah. I went to Michigan state. That's kind of your local entry point, but that also flies counterculture to at the time, look, Michigan was very good. Michigan was winning the big 10. And now you have this kid who's a Spartan fan and he hates Michigan openly. It just, it was look right time, right place, um, right people. And it worked. And then it hasn't, it's one damn near 20 years later. It hasn't stopped working. So that's a booyah right there. The oh, oh we're doing hand yeah, gestures. That's now. it. Okay. You know, um, yeah, very proud of you. And uh, I think what, 17 years of uh, the number one ranked afternoon yeah. show. Yep. And uh, the listeners um, haven't, you know, done anything but continue to embrace. And I think sometimes you are polarizing, if that's fair. And I that's think if you're, but it's like anything else. If, if you're, if, how do I put it? If people don't talk about you, right, then you're not saying anything. And if people don't, if you never say anything wrong, you didn't say anything at all. So I, I don't care about being right or wrong is immaterial. It's about, did you entertain the listener? Did you engage the listener? So like, I think I've I've got a pretty good knack about I never let it enter my mindset about oh geez you know I could end up being wrong about this in two years who cares nobody for, cares for your listeners of the show that are watching or listening this um, I know I believe anyway that what you say is always your opinion yeah and that it isn't created for any shock value or any stir the pot uh, no because you'll right? get found out real quick look like. I think there's a couple keys and I don't know how granular you want to go with this, but like part of the problem in media now is you've got agendas being pushed down from corporate at certain places um, where people are put in a position, Hey, this is what you're going to put out there. And if you don't want to do it, we'll find somebody else. That's a real problem, not only in sports media, but also in political coverage, also in news coverage. It's, Media is crossing that line into a dangerous place. Whereas, look, I've I've never had that issue. Now, I've had to fight harder at certain times in my career of, hey, when you do A, B, and C, it causes a problem. And my answer is, well, then you can find somebody else because this is, this is how it should be done. You pay me for my opinion. You pay me for my perspective. If you ask me to change that opinion or perspective, 
then you probably need to find somebody else. Now, yes, I probably was crazy to have that attitude at 24 and 25, and I had zero cachet. Now, 17 years later, no, I, I, I don't take programming notes from anybody. I just won't do it. I don't need to do it. I'm, I'm at that point in my career. I've earned a right not to do it, right? So, and it's the same thing for you. You don't have to take investment ideas or opinions from anyone you don't want to. Except you, when you call, Mike. Not true at all. <laughs> I don't bother you at all. My point is you get to that point, you trust yourself, you trust the product. And I think that's what keeps the show super successful is it's uncompromised, right? Like I don't care about relationships with teams. I don't care about relationships with players. I don't care about PR. It's not important to me. You, If you produce, I say nice things. If you don't, I say mean things. It's really that simple. And I think as simple as that is, it's still very refreshing for the medium we're in. We're in a lot of places, so-and-so knows so-and-so, and that's their boy. Or this guy has this loyalty to this team, and he can't see past being a fan. Like, locally, like I mean, you know me as well as anybody. I mean, I'm a huge Spartan fan, but I also wanted Mark D'Antonio launched out of a cannon. You know, it's the greatest coach in school history. It doesn't matter to me, right? The product's the product. The numbers are the numbers. So that's, to me, what helps sustain it. And that's fair. And that is, um, you know, what, again, keeps it original and keeps it raw. Let's segue to COVID and post-COVID or this post-COVID world. And there were no sports for a while, right? As you know, we started this podcast with um, Sully and Bogey. Yep. And my boys. Your boys. And a shout out to those guys, Brand 25. (laughs) Yeah. And uh, with that, we started it because they thought that um, the audience, whatever that is, needed something besides sports because there were no sports. So we needed something. So we decided to talk about finance and the markets. Um, But with your show, if your show is primarily a sports related show, Mm -hmm. what did you do or what did you realize um, for entertainment value? Um, Did you, you know, do then? And then how has that even kind of evolved or morphed even, you know, here we are a year and a half later. So the first, that's funny, you know, you mentioned podcasts. So the first thing we did was we stopped doing our podcast because a lot of that material, that content immediately was going to be needed. Sports disappearing is a situation where you you never view that as real. You never view it as possible. Um, okay, so what are we going to do now? Well, that was the first thing. Um, and then the second thing was, I, I remember, God, this was, I don't know, March 15th, March 20th of 20. And I remember having a meeting with all our guys via phone because we were sent home from the office. And I said, all right, here's what we're going to do. The coverage of sports is when and if are sports going to return. I said, the NFL draft will get us to May. So this was in March. I said, the NFL draft will get us to May. And then the baseball labor strife will get us past there. And then football, will we have it, will get us the rest of the way. And yes, as naive as we all were, I thought by fall we we might be okay. Right? Again, you have to go back to the mindset of March Mm -hmm. of twenty. But it was never this panic. It was never this idea of, oh, well, sports isn't happening. What will we do? It's like when the light goes on, there's an expectation from your listeners. You're going to deliver something of value. And if you're not, then why why am I there? So it was work smarter, figure out, you know, how we can still do sports. Because, again, you you can do non-sports. COVID became currency. I mean, it was what we talked about. It's what we dealt in. And then weaving in and out of how it was impacting sports, yeah, sure, you're going to naturally do that. But look, if you can't talk about the issues of the day, then again, what what is your true value to it? Well, there was COVID, and um, you know the severity of it, the two schools of thought that you know are still probably out there to some degree. But there was the election, yeah, that was as polarizing. Well, that was, that was right? fun. Mm-hmm. So you certainly had content, but is it do you know what do you bring in to your? I listeners? bring everything. Okay, because it's also too as I operate in a bit of a safe space and. It's funny because you'll always get a, you know, this is obviously a very left or right country. There's no room for a third opinion, but the left thinks I'm right and the right thinks I'm left, which okay. is great because I'm, I'm just, I don't have a party. I just openly critique both because I, I honestly think it's one giant folly. So, yeah, I have fun with it. I don't care. Like, that's the, th- again, it comes back to I'm willing to do things. I'm willing to talk about topics and I'm willing to say things that, I, there's this absence of thought for me about what will 
what will be popular or what will curry favor. It's like when you try to please everyone, you please no one. I don't even think about that. That doesn't matter anymore. That was in my 20s. Now it's just go. This is how I'm feeling. You know, nothing we do, like you talked about, nothing we do, you don't have to be inflammatory to inflame, right? You can just talk about things that people aren't comfortable with. And where people's comfort zone ends is kind of where thought begins. And that's what we try to do. Like, I like doing topics, and I, I don't mind doing the real stuff. And I, I, as crazy as this sounds, the pandemic, as stressful as it was, and as scary as it was, it was also some of the most fun I've had doing radio because it was this complete, it was a challenge. It was this thing of, okay, you know, there's no easy button. You're not going to have sports. So what are you going to do? And, I mean, it was amazing to get through it with my guys, and our ratings never been better. You know, it was an incredible time period to just fight through it. The show provided a distraction for me because we were all stuck inside. The show was an unbelievable distraction for me amidst all of that. So I liked it, believe it or not. I, I thought it was kind of a crossroads in my career of like, okay, if you can handle this, you can do anything. And if you don't, well, there's going to be a reality check on the other side of it. Well, I don't know if you thought I would bring this up, but you actually did that, I'm going to say, 10 years earlier. Um, you deleted or you know shut off social media. Yeah. Um, when we became friends, it was 2008, 2009, mm-hmm. and uh, you had a Facebook page, and you had Twitter. And then sometimes mm-hmm. shortly thereafter, boom, yeah. gone, delete, right? And mm-hmm. in, this, in this world that we just said had a podcast and you decided yeah. again to pivot again. Um, I don't know if you know this, but social media is expanding. It's growing. Yeah, I've heard the that. new world, right? Yeah. So it's Instagram and yeah. TikTok. Have you done a TikTok yet? No. Okay. Not a so, child. Right, right, no. right. So can you just explain again yeah. to your listeners why you don't do it and then to yeah. our listeners, our community, what your thoughts are about it now and in the future? Okay. So let's start out with the why. Um, it's atypical for someone in my position to not have it. I know that. But I also have a different mindset where I went, look, people are, want my opinion. They get it from two to six, okay? That's four hours of my day every day, all right? I don't need to offer this stuff outside of two to six. That's one. It's two, it, it comes along with the whole personal development thing where in my 20s, it was all about constantly having to show people, look, I'm good. You need to listen. You need to do this. And the price you pay for it is it really screws things up when the microphone turns off. So you get to a point where you're tired of dealing with the toxicity and the negativity. And I mean, death threats get old after your 50th and you just go, wait a second, let me get this straight. I'm literally allowing total strangers to impact my day or my personal time. And it's not about like you, you agree, you disagree. But when you open your world to that and you read it and you take it in, it comes with a cost. So you get to a point, I remember, I think it was, God, geez, do we, it was probably 2012 maybe or 13. And I had, I had had enough. And I remember it was like Christmas Eve and, and somebody, there were a couple that were just really appalling comments. And I went, you know what? I don't know if we can curse on this. I won't say what I said, but you know what? To hell with this. I'm done. I deleted it, just deleted it all that day. And I go, I don't need this. I don't need any of this nonsense. The people who listen are going to listen regardless. And if they want to offer their opinion, here's how you can get a hold of me. Like Twitter is the equivalent of asking your worst enemy to knock on your door and punch you in the face. It's the dumbest concept in the world. Like I know Twitter was created for this community, town hall, like everyone's opinion matters. Well, here's the reality. A, not everyone's opinion matters because some people's opinions are abhorrent. Second of all, all it did was create echo chambers. It's tribalistic by nature. So now if you have an abhorrent opinion, you'll find others with abhorrent opinions and then go attack people who don't share that opinion. It's a complete waste of time. You're never going to, you're never going to change anybody's mind. No one wins fights on the internet. So you get to a point, and like for me, I knew I needed to be, I needed to be happier in my life for what I had accomplished and what I had done. And one of the ways that I did that was take the nonsense and get rid of it. And it's, it's weird for a lot of people to hear it. They're like, oh, I could never do it. I could give it three weeks. 
Give it three weeks where you're not beholden to that and get rid of all of the nonsense. It's like a personal audit. And like every six months, every 12 months, you should audit the people that are in your life, you know, audit the people that are in your phone, audit the people you associate with. And it's not like this point system. It's just, is this person bringing value to my life or are they not? And as social media goes, it wasn't bringing value to me. My popularity existed before it. And I was confident enough in what we were doing, it would exist after it. Now, look, I get social media's value for businesses, all right? You've got a product to sell or you want to have influencers do their thing. Hey, that's fine. But if you want to talk about the impacts of social media, no, I, I think history will not look back kindly on it. I think social media has brought out the worst in us. I think it's, it's A, it's divisive. B, it's destructive. Um, you know, and I don't know about you, Dewey, but like, I don't remember as a kid hearing nine-year-olds committing suicide. Okay. That happens now because the bullies have 24 hour access to them because every kid is living on their phone. It doesn't make sense to me. It never has. So no, my company wasn't happy with that decision almost a decade ago, but I just told them, I go, if ratings change or revenue changes, call me. Otherwise you don't get to make that decision. I do. And for me, the people who care about me, I still talk to them. Um, I don't need to share my world with strangers. Like, why do I need to share a photo of vacation with a stranger? I don't. Like, you just, I wish I had that mindset at 22 that it took me until 32 to figure out. But, like, it's part of evolution. It's part of growing. And I just think social media, whether you're in radio or whether you're Bob the Builder, it, it has a negative consequence because you see people, A, living a lie, right? Everyone knows the Facebook couple who you thought they were happy and they just filed for divorce because everything they were putting up was BS, you know, or the guy who's woefully insecure and showing you the life he wants you to think that he's living, but you really know he's a complete loser. Like, you, it just clicks eventually. So when you get rid of all of that, you realize how much more time there is in the day and you realize how few people really matter. Everything else is just noise. So tune the noise out. So it's not one size fits all, but it's, it's what worked for me. And I'm, I'm telling you, I became, it allowed me to become a better person. It allowed me to become a better radio host. You know, it just allows you to operate in a clear space, in a better head space without, oh, hey, look, here's 186 more mentions, you know, and at least 90 of them are going to be toxic. Don't need it. But so a lot of people in social media that use it just want attention, right? And those are- those Right, are, which is the opposite of me. Right. right. I never got into doing, right, you know right, this because right, you know me. Right. I never got into this deal for that. Right. I don't care about that. That doesn't right. matter to right. me. And as crazy as that sounds, that's me. When I'm off the air, I'm done. Oh, I do know this. I I'm will, done. I will vouch for that. Mike No, it, because that's, I, I, I like- The ghost. The I ghost. like to be left alone. Like I go home, I love my wife, I love our dogs, I love my family, and I'm done. There's no more. I don't believe people deserve 24-7 access to anybody. Like, you know me, I'm old school about business stuff. You're never getting a call from me at 8 or 9 at night. Are you insane? That's your personal time. Now, if you've called me, that's right. different. You've asked for my time. But it's just, I don't do it for that. The attention-seeking, it, it creates Man, it's almost like a drug addict, right? People become addicted to a random stranger's validation of a thumbs up or a heart or a this or a that. And it's, it's complete lunacy because those people, they end up caring more about a total stranger than what their own spouse thinks of them. It's, it's, it's lunacy. The world's completely upside down with it. The word is toxic. It is toxic. Toxic, for sure. It totally is. Hey, guys, it's Brooke. I want to take a minute to talk to you about Dewey Stefan and his great team at Great Lakes Wealth. Do you feel overwhelmed managing your assets? Well, Great Lakes Wealth offers Wall Street solutions with Main Street values. That is really what they are all about. They will help you develop a custom financial plan utilizing all of your assets and keeping your goals in mind. That is what Great Lakes Wealth is all about, helping you and your family achieve your financial dreams. So go to greatlakeswealth.com us to schedule an appointment today and tell them Brooke sent you. Well, that's a good segue. Let's switch to then what do you do off of the air? What is your uh, normal day like from before 2 p.m. and after 6 p.m.? And then maybe throw in a little weekend action. Okay. Um, this is going to be woefully boring. But so, okay, take the pandemic out of it. 
because all of our days got real weird. But like, I mean, like honestly, if we take away, okay. I what? mean, let's start at like you were 6 a.m. No, 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 you hit no, the no. gym. No, no, I mean, no, you're sleeping no, until no, 9.30. Six, six, no, and, uh, no, middle ground. <laughs> no, I, I'm a 7 or 7.30 guy. Um, my wife's a teacher, so I ain't trying to wake up that early. The lovely Mel. That's right. Shout out to Mel. That's right. But um, no, like I, okay, watch a lot of sports. Okay, duh. Read a lot. So do you do that? So that's a great question. Uh, do you um, have them on, you know, record? Do you watch them live? Do you have like, I mean, your man cave has 32 yeah. uh, TVs. No, and no, 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 no. You have 32 eyeballs? No. So, okay. So this is the interesting part. You that have was, to do research. That was the other thing I did early on in my career. And it's, it's an issue of work smarter, not harder. And it doesn't matter what industry you're in. Like you have to develop better work practices or you're going to burn out. You're going to lose your mind. So the amount of stuff where I would watch start to finish at 25 versus where I'm at at 40, you find ways around it. And look, technology has helped that. Who are we kidding? So like, yeah, when there's a quick cut of a game and I can go get it, download it, watch it at my convenience. Awesome. Now, some of it you can't replace. If the Tigers are in a pennant chase right now, I'm watching every game, every pitch, every night. That was several years of my life. Why? Because context. You can't just parse out this random moment in a baseball game, you know, ALCS. You, you have to be watched. You have to watch. Now it's, okay, pick the things that are most important, prioritize them, and go. And certain things are going to fall by the wayside. They have to. There aren't enough hours in the day. Um, but if you're talking like non-work stuff, I mean, honestly, the thing I enjoy doing most is cooking which that's just growing up Italian. That's growing up in the kitchen with my mom and dad. And like, I, lo I love to cook. I love a good bottle of red wine. You know, I like bourbon. Uh, not as much as I used to because the hangovers are absolutely brutal in your a late lot 30s. A little cigar here and there. I do, yeah. Yeah, no doubt. But it's quiet stuff. Honestly, do It's just the quiet stuff. I love being home. I like my space. And I don't, again, see, this is, so many people would do it and want the attention and want to be out and about and want, I, I don't, Look, I'm nice to everybody who comes up to me. Like it, it, it's fine, but I don't need that. That ain't that. That's just not what it is for me. I, I, I can't. Exp There's such a hard divide between me on the air and me off the air. I was gonna say, have you heard this before? Because we haven't really talked about it. But I, you know, you know, what's Mike like? What's Mike like? I'm like off the air. He is um, quiet and yeah. reserved, and um, he doesn't want the spotlight or the yeah. limelight. And is that fair? And do you it's more than fair. No, but it's it's funny because everyone's like, well, what's he like? What's he like? And, you know, I guess my response is, well, it's not really your business to know. You know, there has to be a piece of me that's for me. There has to be a piece of me that's for my family and my wife. And, like, you can't it's, – it's almost like a trial attorney. You can't take that home with you. You won't have a functional home life. You won't have personal relationships. You have to turn it on and off. And, like, me on the air is a piece of me. But it's not all of, like, who I am. I can't take the guy that's on from two to six. What am I going to do? Go home and then get in some huge debate with my wife about school or about like the Tigers? That's absurdity. It's insane. So like you just, you power down. I take the 30 minutes it takes to get home and you just kind of, by the time you get home, you level out. Like the dopamine rush of doing radio and killing it and having a great time or stressing out. All those emotions are two to six. And the ramp up to it. Remember, there's a ton of prep that goes into this where we really started about 9 a.m. And then, you know, we have a living document for our show sheet and you do show meeting. And then, yeah, you get your adrenaline going. You're ready to rock. I time out my caffeine, which I know sounds like lunacy, but that's I have to do it. Um, and then you get ready to crush and you go. And by six o'clock, I feel like if you're not leaving tired, not in the same way that, you know, I'm not a mason, right? I'm not building pools. But if you don't leave mentally tired, then you, you you didn't go hard enough. You didn't work hard enough at it. You know, it's not supposed to be this casual sit back. Hey, this is really fun. You know, Tigers played great. That's not what this is. So, yeah, by the time I get home, man, I'm done. Right. I'm chill. I want to go home. I want to cook dinner for my wife. I want to chill out, talk, talk to the dogs, see how their day was. That's the best part about dogs. They don't have bad days. And just relax. And I don't need... I'm not a social butterfly like you. 
You like to go out and you know, bebop around town? That That's you. Bebop. Yeah, come on, man. You, you used to be a bar star. I love that. <laughs> bar star. You were bebop. a bar star. I come love on. it. The bebop and the bar star. That's not me. It's never been me. I um, Well, I do know that you like to travel, again, yes. when appropriate, when it's safe, and when it's yeah. um, you know available on yeah. your, your schedule. Um, you know, do you have you know, uh, places that you like to go? Is it the beach? Is it to the woods, to a cabin? You know, Definitely not choice B. Definitely not that. No, I, um, one, one thing, you know, I started to do and I'd finally gotten around to it and the pandemic has kind of thrown that adrift a little was doing a college football trip every year. That one's a fun one. You know, you have a bucket list of these places. Like, you know, you, you grew up like I did. You, you watch on Saturdays and you see all these cathedrals of college football and you're like, man, I want to go there someday. And as a kid, it seems so far away, you know, growing up and you're, you know, I didn't, we didn't grow up with any, any money or anything. And no one had ever gone to college. College was this real foreign concept. So like you kind of make that list in your mind of like, man, I want to, I want to do that someday. And then you go to Michigan state, right. And you're lucky enough to, to experience the big 10 and go to places like Madison and Ann Arbor and you know, all that Columbus, but you're like, okay, those feel close, but now, you know, Baton Rouge still feels real far away or like the Grove down at Ole Miss, but like being able to do some of those things. And I was doing that. And um, I'm so glad I'm, you know, obviously I'm blessed to be able to have done as many as I have, but like COVID totally killed. One of the ultimate ones was we had, we had a Saturday night in Death Valley plan for LSU. So I'm going to get around and do that again. Um, but as far as like where my wife and I like to go, Honestly, like Vegas is still number one. We love that. Um, big fan of Phoenix, Scottsdale. Um, Miami, who doesn't like Miami? The right time of year, not now. You, you melt. Um, and then, yeah, like obviously like. NYC. I, I've. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, that's you can't you can't ask me not to. I, I love I love Manhattan and I love New York. It's it's just part of what I like. Look, there was a time in my life I imagined that's where I was ending up. There was a time in my life where. I didn't think I'd ever have a lawn, you know, like I, that's, you just want a high rise and you want to go to the city. You don't want to own a car. There's a part, there's always going to be a part of me that, that that's still what I could imagine, but life changes and you change. And yes, before the pandemic, I would be in New York city four or five times a year. Um, I haven't been back since it started. Like one of my favorite stories is I told you I was going to New York for a business trip. This is before Great Lakes oh, Wealth was, was open. When Scotty showed up. Yeah. Scotty showed up uh, mm -hmm. for, this is the second story. There's two stories now. Okay. We'll, oh, do, the, we'll do the Scotty story first. Uh, for those that don't know, Scott Coning, shout out, uh, introduced us. So we'll give him <laughs> a little credit for that. And uh, with that, I said, I was going to New York and it was Scott's first visit. He had never been. Mm -hmm. And I was going for a business trip and uh, Scott was going to fly in towards the end of the trip. And uh, I was going to kind of show him some spots. And you said, I'll be in town. So let's uh, have dinner, right? So we went and we had a, I think it was at uh, Just Meats or Has Meats or Got Meats. Quality Meats. Quality Meats, right? I so, was going to let you flounder there for a yes, little while. Yes, and uh, so we had a wonderful dinner. But I remember, again, um, you know, bumping into you, so to speak, yeah. in New York. I pulled a caper. Yes. But another time I said, I don't know. You I'm didn't tell the best part of the story. Okay, go ahead. Go no, I just I'm not going to say it. You can tell. No, it. we just waited. We waited for you to go to the bathroom. And I said to Scott, I go, what do you want? Let's stick him with the bill. He goes, what do you mean? I go, it's simple. We're going to refuse to take our credit cards out. And Mr. Big Mouth over here is going to take care of the bill. He goes, you'll never be able to get him to do it. I go, trust me, watch this. And when it came, I just shamed you in front of the waitress and you picked up the bill. We tolerated you, you bloviating all dinner and talking and well, doing your thing. And I said, okay, watch this. And you've never forgiven me for it. For all those out there that are watching <laughs> and listening, you know, there's three sides to every story. There's your truth, my truth, <laughs> and, and the, the truth. truth. Yeah, exactly. And we need to get Scott in here. So yes, the story doesn't go exactly like that, but that's how I recollect. At the end of the day, I certainly manned up and took care of that, that tab great. and didn't even, you know, fat and I eyelash <laughs> my wallet hurt uh you know welcome to new york <laughs> welcome to I said new, york. new york pricing well no I, that is that was a wonderful places. night we had a great time we traveled a bunch this summer um but new york i haven't been back to i, I want to go around christmas i really do want to get back and i want to see some friends and yeah i I'm, I'm hoping it's like i remember it you know new york had a rough ride uh, we all did but new york got really crushed and the population density does that and i just i want it to be the way i remember it so I've kind of I've kind of waited as long as I can to get back. So yeah, I'm gonna, I'm going to try to go this winter and and get back.
And that's the same, uh, you know, in the investment world. It's obviously um, the mecca of investments with Wall Street and the investment banks yeah. and the industry there. And so I would go also four or five times a year. Um, and we haven't gone back uh, since uh, COVID and we have no plans. We use Zoom and we use technology. Isn't it crazy how what, what was totally unacceptable before is now absolute protocol? And it's just kind of the way it's going to be. Yeah. You know, it used to be, hey, you know, you've got a meeting in New York. You have to get on a plane. You're going to New York. What do you mean you're going to conference in? That'd be like viewed as a sign of disrespect. What do you mean? We'll get on a plane for an hour? Now, people would look at you sideways if you're like, yeah, no, I'm going to I'm gonna fly. No, really, you don't have to. Just join the Microsoft Teams. It's crazy. Yeah. Crazy. It, it makes a lot of people more efficient with their day and with 100%. their time. As you said before, watching games, you can speed through and you can get the clips. You can and just get more done. Get more done, right? So technology has those advantages, and we also talk about the disadvantages of the toxicity of it all. Right. Um, let's change gears. And we're uh, you know running out of time, so to speak. But um, I want to spend a few minutes from your perspective on, you know, investing or just, you know, building a life for the future. You said yeah. it a little bit earlier about having goals and what are goals. And you are, you know, the perfect client, if I can say so. Don't repeat it again. But in terms of asking, what can we do, Do we? Here's my goal. Yeah. I want to retire at a certain age. I want to invest or have a certain thing, right? So you find out your goal, yeah. and then we discuss it, and we work it through. So for all, all those that are listening and watching, um, besides just your day job, you know, is it side hustles? Is it, you know, what what is it? Yeah. I mean, okay, that's... And I'll preface it by saying in the past, we have told our audience that the average millionaire has seven streams of income. Yeah, it's um, I wish I had gotten started earlier on the side stuff. And I know I'm I'm still earlier than a lot. But like, I think one of the coolest things I, I ever read and then started to conceptualize was, look, you know, your nine to five is spoken for, but your six to 12 isn't. So you make a conscious decision of what you're willing to do and not do to get the things you want. And then look, it, 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 it's this idea of I've always been super goal oriented and I've always been a hustler and like, a, you know, I just, I used to be too maniacal about it. And, and, you know, that comes with it, with its own personal tax. where like, you're so driven to succeed and you're so myopic in your focus that like you end up hurting personal relationships. You know, you end up burning people out and, and that had to change, but like, yes, there are side things I do. There are other interests I have, but everything is just plan, have a plan, get someone who's intelligent like you get someone you can trust and work at the plan. Everyone thinks that it's going to be this turnkey thing and it's going to be easy and it's going to be linear. And that's, that's not, that's not life. Nothing works that way. Life is not linear. You know, you're going to take steps back. You're going to take exponential moves forward. And just, you have to commit to the plan. Like I, I always, whether it's friends or strangers or like you hear about people and they, they say they have goals and then they don't do anything to attain them. You have to make a commitment to the goal. Like you, you have to, there's follow through that is required. So I think for me, I try to be good about the follow through and I try to be very pragmatic about, okay, I may think this is a good idea, but maybe I need to really see what the, how do we actualize it? You know, is now the right time for that? But yeah, I try to do well with multiple, you know, projects at a time. I know where my, my bread is mainly buttered. Like that's my, that's my baby. That's my, my, that's my radio. It's my life. I mean, it's what I do. But yes, everything is planning. I'm always looking down the line. You always make fun of me about it. But it's like, I just want to know that like the things I've done that I've put myself in a position that, you know, God forbid anything happens to me. The people I care about are good, you know, and while I'm here, I get to live the life. Like I've already gotten to live a life I never imagined. You know, I didn't I didn't grow up with designs on doing the. Th if you would have told me I've done the things I've done in my life, I never would have believed it. But I just want to be able to keep doing that. So like, yeah, eventually, yeah, I would like to not have to yell about bad baseball teams all the time and stuff, but just plan. Like, it doesn't matter if you're young, plan. And, and, and it may not seem like much money. Whatever you can put away, put it away. Be intelligent about it. Get your side hustle. You know, don't just be happy with what you're doing by day. Find something else. And it doesn't, that's the other thing is 
get comfortable with slow growth. Like you don't have to hit grand slams all the time, you know, put a few singles in the outfield, you know, like do things that just bring a return and then do more of it or do two or four or six or eight compound. Yeah. Just, just keep grinding. And I think if you, it doesn't matter. It's all an issue of scale, right? Like all we're, Anyone who's got the the growth mindset and the, the mindset of saving, like it doesn't matter. It's just all about, we're all doing the same thing. It's just got different zeros behind it, right? There are guys who are doing billion dollar deals and there's people who are, how, how can I grab another 50 bucks on a Wednesday? It's all the same concept. You either are growth oriented or you're not. You're a hustler or you're not. So yeah, start early. Really don't, don't doubt yourself. Like, you know, what's funny too is like, I don't, Failing's okay in my 20s or even up till just probably five years ago, my mid 30s. Failing sucks. But like now you can, I failed at certain things and I look at it and I go, okay, what can I take from it? What can I learn from this? How do we do it better the next time? And that's okay. Like if you haven't failed, you haven't tried anything. So like, yeah, fail a couple of times, fail a bunch, and then you'll get certain things right and you'll kill it. And it just, I don't know. I just don't want to be bored. I don't want to stop. I want to keep doing stuff. So we say there's the main hustle. That's that nine to five. And then there's the side hustle, right? So six that's very 12. important. Six to 12. So yeah. I haven't heard that before. But we always say around here, what do we do? And Great Lakes Wealth, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Yeah, so the first part of what you said about um, planning, planning, planning. That's what that means. If you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. No, that's good. I that, like I like your phrase better. That does not go to the last thing that Mike just said, which is, you know, it's okay to fail. It's okay to fail. You better not fail on putting your plan together. No, right? I'm just saying that in the course of like, if you don't fail, you never tried anything. Right. Who, who the hell bats a thousand? Nobody. But the whole world is so afraid. It goes back to your social media thing. People are terrified of failing because of this, you know, public shaming or whatever it is. It's like, look. The people who are making fun of you for failing have never done a damn thing in their life. They're just sitting there, you know, like, what is it, Millhouse on The Simpsons and going, ha, ha, and pointing their finger. It's like, well, you're a loser. It doesn't matter. Just try. Like, if you try, you've already succeeded. I think there's a Michael Jordan quote out there about I've, you know, missed like 8,000 shots, but I've made, you know, X, Y, Z game winners, right? Yeah, look, look at baseball. I mean, if you succeed 30% of the time, you go to the Hall of Fame. Yeah. You know, like you don't have to bat a thousand. Don't put the pressure on yourself, but you better try. You have to keep going, taking your bites at the apple and connect. And in investing, we talk about being diversified and you have to put some of your investments in high risk, potentially high return. Yeah. Sometimes they, uh, you know, may just return your capital. They could even lose. But if you have... Um, different investments and you average, uh, we've talked about this in a prior episode, a prior episode, some that uh, return your capital, others that return five, 10 or 15 or 20, right. you're going to do better than the one who just has it in a safe investment at three yeah, or no, four, you, right? you have to have a multi-platform strategy. And again, it doesn't matter how little you have or how much you have, or whether you're a billionaire or a dollar millionaire, you, you have to start it and you have to stick to it. Take it, chances. Well, some, yeah, but it's also about taking advice from the right people. Like, don't be selfish about it. Don't be petulant about it. Hell, there have been times you've checked me on certain ideas I've had or what I've thought was the right way to do it. There's other times where I've said, look, what about this? And you're like, hey, that's not a harebrained idea. You got to have a teammate in this. Like, if you're really going to do it, um, you know, and then I always keep you abreast of the things I'm doing and what I got going on and kind of, it just works. That's how it's supposed to work. You know, you got to find somebody and you stick with them. That's why, for better or for worse, I've stuck with you for this long. So, yeah. Hey, that uh, goes both ways, my friend, oh, and I please. appreciate that. So we're going to wrap up, and you mentioned, again, some um, of your words of wisdom, and I appreciate but we have an official not segment. words of wisdom. No, they just are. Might take well, it's things. common That's sense. It. A lot of it is common sense, right? But a lot of people try to make things more complicated than they are, or I'm there's this trying, other thing. I'm not trying to author a book here, man. No, no, I'm just but giving also, you my take. I, I hear you, and I really appreciate it, and so do our viewers and our listeners, I have to imagine. But we always say our first step here is to get started. So you have to do something. A lot of people have paralysis, you know what they call it, uh, paralysis by analysis. So you have to kind of work through and have someone to talk to and all those things. Um, we're going to wrap up with a part of the show we call, mm. instead of what do we do, we call it what Mike do. And what this means is what would the- God, that sounds awkward. All right, go ahead. What would Mike do? Meaning, what would Mike go back and tell his 18-year-old self or, oh, or other 
current 18-year-olds out there today on any subject, any idea <laughs> um, to you know live their best life? All right, this is the benefit of having two younger sisters because I've actually had to play this game. So, What like, Mike do? All right. Um, well, for one, be get off your damn phone. That'd probably be a good start. Just don't don't allow total strangers to affect your perception of who you are. I wasted a lot of time doing that. You know, I wasted basically my entire 20s doing it. So, yeah, don't do that. It's a total waste of energy. It's a total waste of, of creativity. And just, just get away from all of it. It's garbage. You know, it's okay to have a smaller circle because it's people who matter. So that would be one. And then, honestly, I think the biggest frustration I have, and I see it with younger people who want to get into my industry or not, you have to be willing. I mean, are we allowed to curse on this or not? S- slight curse words. Our uh, team in the back, Rachel, is uh, uh, giggling a little bit. So we could have. Uh, all you right, know, let lot- me let me rephrase it because I have. I, I, we, when I when I, like I've talked to classrooms and I've talked to college kids yes. and like I have a phrase, but I can't use it here. So it'd be like, um, you have to be willing to eat some dirt. Okay, nobody wants to eat dirt. It's not fun. It's not ideal, but it's part of the process, and you have to. You have to accept that you're going to have to do a bunch of things you don't want to do in this life right. to get to earn the right to do the things you want to do. And I, I think a lot of that's getting lost. And that's Pay not, your dues. Yeah, but it, and it's not even I'm not trying to turn into get off my lawn guy. Right. Okay. It's more just we've gotten to a place where everyone feels like, OK, well, here's the linear path. I'm going to get good grades in high school. I'm going to go to college. I'm going to borrow a bunch of money. I'm going to get a degree that probably won't make me any money. And then I'm going to have trouble paying those loans back. And then I'm going to wonder, well, why don't I have the job exactly what I want at age 23? Where along the line is that? That's not how it works. Like your 20s are designed for you to eat dirt. Like your 20s are designed for you to set up the rest of your life. That's a 10 year grind. Like life doesn't even really begin until 30. So just... I think I would tell myself that as I was super maniacal about, okay, I have to get here by X. No, you don't. You're setting that barometer up and you're probably going to fail. And then once I, once I attain that, I'm like, well, I got to do this by Y. And you're like, I look back at that stuff and I look at like, it's probably why I have so much gray in my beard, but it's just allow yourself a little grace, allow yourself to go on the journey and just just be okay. Like smell the roses a little more. Like I, I wasted a lot of time not smelling the roses and just really being a red ass. So yeah, I would probably try to fix that and get off your damn phone. Get <laughs> That'd off be number your two. Damn just phone. do it. It's I'm, try for three weeks. Be better for your health, not yeah. off your phone for work. Get off the nonsense. Try it. You'll like it. Well, with that, I appreciate you coming in. That's a great uh, place to stop, Mike. Uh, This has been great. This is uh, episode 45. This is season two, episode three of the What Do We Do podcast. Again, with my friend, our community member, Mike Valenti. And with that, we always say, live your best life. And we're just getting started. Oh, we're doing this again. Yeah. Goodbye. Thanks for being here. (laughs) The opinions expressed in this program are for general information purposes only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual or any specific security. It's only intended to provide education about the financial industry. To determine which investments may be appropriate for you, consult your financial advisor prior to investing. Any past performance discussed during this program is no guarantee of future results. Any indices referenced for comparison are unmanaged and cannot be invested into directly. As always, please remember investing involves risks and possible loss of principal capital. Please seek advice from a licensed professional.